We are starting a new topic, page 62. So let's just recap how we got to this point. We started with tefillah, prayer in general. What's the idea of tefillah? What it's meant to do for us? We spoke about the structure of the synagogue. So we've got the temple service and the sacrifices and how they relate. Then we said, well, let's talk about brachot because a major part of prayer and tefillah are brachot that we make as well. We've now moved forward into the Shema. So we're creeping forward into uh, the next section. So let's talk about the Shema, what it's all about, when it's said, how it's meant to be said, when we say it, why we say it, and what the word means. Let's start with that. At this point, you should know me. What does the word Shema actually mean? Listen. 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 What else? Hear. What's the difference between listening and hearing? I see you're not married yet. Obviously, you haven't been married. Because my wife will say to me many, many times, you're listening to me, but you're not hearing what I'm telling you. Right. Right. So really the Shema is going to be more than just listen. It's going to be to hear and to understand. And to understand. To take the ideas that you're taking into your mind and understand them. I want to give another translation of the word Shema, which none of you have ever heard before. Oh, you get that one? sort of did there? Never heard before. Wow. I feel good. I feel good. When you get to this stage in my life, you have a social life, things are just actually like... Okay, there's another interpretation we see in Tanakh, and we see the sh word Shema apply when it comes to shepherding, I believe. The word Shema also means to gather together, like a person will gather together their flock, it's to gather together. That was what I realized, the shoresh, the root of the word Shema, we see in relation to gathering something together. Why would the word for listening or hearing or understanding be the same word as to gather something together? Items, separate items, and to bundle them into one place or one piece. Things. Anyone want to hazard a guess? Sorry to make you think so much on a Wednesday morning when you're ready, just getting for the weekend and ready for next weekend. You know? What's the difference, let's put it this way, between seeing and hearing? In between re'iyah, seeing, and hearing, shmia. What's better? What's better, seeing or hearing? Seeing something. You would have thought, right? When you see it, they say seeing is believing, but you could be seeing something which isn't reality. Right? You could be looking at a photograph that is photoshopped, right? or a video that's been totally changed, or you see a circumstance. When you see something, you basically have one vision of it, and whatever you see, that picture is what you see. It's a very two-dimensional reality, or maybe three-dimensional, yeah? You see it, and it goes straight in, right to the eyeballs and right into the brain. It doesn't take too much thinking. And we're told to see certain things that are told, a in effect, certain things you can see that will give you evidence of various realities. But something needs a lot more work, and that is to hear something. You can see in any language, right? But you can't hear and understand in any language. When you hear something, you don't see it as one capture. You don't see it as one vision. You have to take one word, and then you get another word, which is what I'm doing right now, and I'm supplying you different words, and you're bundling them together, you're putting them into your brain, and you now have to work into categorizing, understanding, in many cases maybe translating, in order to make sense of what you're listening to. So hearing takes a lot more work, doesn't it? Because now you're having various pieces of information and you're having to interpret and understand and to reflect. 
and to make a full understanding and appreciation from what you're listening to. The Shema is not just a prayer. The Shema involves an understanding based upon not just reading the words in a rote fashion, but taking ideas, we're going to see probably the most important ideas that exist in Judaism, pulling them together, together, and making sense of them, hopefully in a way that will impact your life. For this reason, the Shema is considered the most important tefillah. It is said twice a day, every single day. It is said before a person goes to sleep. As we'll see, it's so important that it's actually the first prayer we teach a child and is the last words if a person merits it to say as they leave this world. So of all the tefillah we have, and all the prayers, and the Amid is always going to be at a high level for sure, but the Shema is still going to win over as having within it the most important ikran, most important principles of our faith. When you say this, you're really committing yourself to God, Israel, and the Jewish people. If you like, this is our national anthem. It's a long one, but this is our national anthem. Okay? Let's have a look at the Gemara. The Gemara in Sukkah says, Tan Rabbana, we're on page 62, Shema, part 1. Tan Rabbana, Katan, a child, Yodel Daber, Aviv Lomdo Torah, who knows how to speak, his father teaches him Torah. Right? And what does he teach him? Siva Lanu Morasha, Moshe Morasha Kilit Yaakov. Right? The Torah that Moshe Rabbeinu commanded us is the heritage of Yaakov, of Jacob. Okay? It's so one of the first things you teach, and that's why in the yeshivas, or Jewish day, the one thing they do is Torah, Tziva, Lanu, Moshe, Torah. It's based on this Gemara. Right? One of the first things you say is that you are Jewish, and Hashem gave us through Moshe Rabbeinu his Torah, and you're part of the Jewish people. Right? The Kilat of Yaakov. And the first verse of the Shema. You teach them that, and Shema. That's the first thing a child should hear and should learn. The first verse of the Shema. Okay? And we naturally do it. You know, before a child goes to sleep, right? We cover our eyes, tell them to cover their eyes, and we teach them Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. It's the first thing we teach them. Let us have a look at the words themselves. So we have Shema. Okay? We have Shema. Yisrael, Hashem, Elokeinu, Hashem, Hashem, Talbeh, Echad. Okay? You'll see that when it is printed and written, we'll notice there is a large ayin and a large dalad. A large ayin and a large dalad. So when you read it, you see that everything else is put into, you know, Times New Roman 12. And then we kind of like, and we bold the entire verse. Yeah. And then we put the iron and the dollar into a, I don't know, like a 20 or 24. You know what I'm talking about? Okay, why? Iron dollar spells A, which means a witness. This is our testimony, like a witness is making in a court of law. Like a witness is making a testimony. This is, we, the Jewish people, are the Adim, right? The witnesses to Kodesh Baruch Hu in this world. The custom, we'll see, is to cover our eyes when we say the Shema. Why do we do that? Why do we do that? Anybody? Somebody? It's not a trick question. Yes, Nedda. I don't know about like covering the eyes, but I know like you're like you make like a shin on your forehead. You there like, is a custom to do that, yes. To put there as a shin like that on our heads as we do it. That is a custom. That is not halacha. The custom is to completely cover our eyes. Yeah? I will see why in a second, by the way. Right, it's the shin of Shema. Yeah. 
Oh, it's actually not just a shin, it's also a dalad and a yud. It's actually like this, shin, and a dalad over here, and the yud is the one over there. So it's the name of Hashem. Shin with the dalad and the yud is Shakai, Hashem's name. Which can relate to the mezuzah, which we'll see inside the Shema as well. It improves concentration. It improves concentration. Actually, the halacha is that when you say the Shema, which is a Torah mitzvah, you should have, when you say it in the morning and night time, because it's a Torah mitzvah, when you cover your eyes, because you have to have complete concentration. The lacha is actually, if you don't have concentration, you have to repeat it. The custom, however, is not to repeat it, because if you didn't have concentration the first time, you won't have it the second time either. I once heard a beautiful thing, which I actually put in my first book, that when you want to see something, you open your eyes. If you want to see something at a distance, you squint, right? You close your eyes. If you want to see something far or far, far away, you have to close your eyes, all right? Some things are so far that they're not visible to us. You have to close your eyes in order to envision that thing which is far, far away. But the basic answer is we want to have complete concentration, okay? Okay, so that's the word itself. So what do the words even mean? Shema, listen, Yisrael, this is the word said to Yaakov, Yisrael. Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem is our God. Hashem Echad, last class we about Elokeinu. Okay, we put together Hashem, Yud with a Hey, with a with a Hey, right? Midat Rachamim. And the Lokeinu, we said, is Midat Din, judgment. So the two are mixed together because Hashem needs both good things and bad things happen to us in this world. Whether through this from last class, we have Hashem's name of mercy, Yud with a Hey, with a with a Hey, and Hashem's name of Rachamim, of, uh, sorry, of Din of judgment. Okay, and we say the good and the bad comes from Hashem. Hashem Echad. God is one. There is one. That doesn't just mean God is one. means there is only one. There is only one. The custom when we say this last word is to enunciate every letter. Echad. All right? You shouldn't say echad. You have to be very careful to enunciate every single letter within the word echad. When you say the word echad, you have aleph is one, chet is eight, dalad is four. So when you say Echad, you're saying Hashem is one in Shemayim, in Chet, in the seven heavens and here on earth, that's eight, in the seven heavens in the Rakia, that's eight, and the Dalad is four, which is the four parts of the world, right? North, east, eight in the seven heavens, Shemayim, and Aras and the earth, and the four is the four parts of this world, right? Front, back, right, left, north, east, south, west. Now, you're actually meant to have that in mind when you say the word Echad. You're testifying Hashem's, you're testifying Hashem's oneness is everywhere. Rashi, fascinatingly, I think we'll look at this Rashi later on, it's just an introduction, because we spent a lot of time in the Shema, but Rashi says that um, Hashem, Yisrael, Hashem, Elokeinu, that Hashem is one. It's actually present and future. Right now, Hashem is our God. But he won't be a chad until Mashiach comes. So the, this is actually all of Jewish history, right? We'll see in code if it's one verse. A chad means for us, he's al he's our God. But Hashem, a chad, when Mashiach comes, the rest of the world will see as right now is not one for the entire world, it's one for us. In the future, when Mashiach comes, he'll be one for the entire world. So this actually takes us to the end of creation. Four, eight, and one adds up to? 13. Right, four plus eight, carry the nine, and minus three, yes, it's 13. 13 is correct. What other word do we see? A very famous word also has the same gematria, numerical value, as 13. It's a difficult question, I know. A lot of words are there. But this word is compared to another word. Ahava. Ahava. Is that right? Is that for 13? I hope I'm right. Is that right? Yeah. Ah. Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay? So this is actually a declaration of love. When you say this, when you say the word echad, you finish, and you're saying echad is the same gematria, numerical value as ava, as love, and the two are coming together. Okay? There's no greater uh, expression of love. Okay? So, once again, we're doing a Torah mitzvah. It's to be said twice a day. We just saw over here the first words the person says, a uh, child to be taught, are these words of Shema So This first verse, okay, which appears in the Torah itself. And we say the idea of Shema is I'm about to say to it, I have to understand it, not just listen to it, but also have to interpret it. 
right? It's a form of study. Right? You can understand it and listen to it, and it's not just like a rote, like, you know, just like, just like reading through a uh, rote. No prayer we said should be, hopefully, but this was specifically, you have to have intention, and we built up our intention by covering our eyes uh, in order to have a full understanding. Okay? Says the Chumat Adam, page 62, he says, Sedevidui Shechimura, a person, when a person is on their deathbed, right, in order to, and when they're about to move to the next world, Vayoma Shema Yisrael, Baruch Shem Kibom Achsolam Ba'ed, he should say, Bless you, Hashem, uh, as well as the Shema prayer. Okay? What page are you on? You're on page 62, at the bottom over there, right? Yeah? Shema and Baruch Shem Kavol Machatol Yilam Ba'ed. Kusar Hashem's name over there. And we'll see what that verse is all about. We'll see what that verse is all about. That verse does not appear in the Torah. and has a very interesting history to it. We'll get there, okay? So, first words, says the Gemara. The person says, and the last words for leaving this world. Why? Because in both of them, you're attaching yourself to a Kodesh Baruch to God. So a child wants to attach themselves as early as possible, and before the neshama leaves the body, okay, in order for that to be a smoother process, and a uh, form of teshuva as well, that's what we do. Okay? Uh, yeah, well, that's what you connect, because the person may be scared they're going to lose their life at that time. That's why they're saying it. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a good thing to say. Okay? I read a book which spoke about how, oh, I'll tell you something very cute, actually. It just occurred to me. You like this, you like this. The Shema, the word Shema is made up of three letters, a Shin and a Mem and an Aleph. I heard this idea, and then Son Shu, and I heard it, I thought, a little bit too wacky. I thought, you know, it sounds like, you know, Rabbi Trump. And then someone showed to me, actually, that it's based in one of the, in the Kabbalistic books, okay? The Shema used to be used as a form of meditation, and I would say, that to fill a prayer is not just meditation, but it has within it certain meditative qualities that go with it. And the Shema, was your Ari Kaplan says this in his book, Jewish Meditation, a practical guide, um, that the Shema was used as a form of, I don't use the word mantra, but because it has other connotations actually used. So you're going to like this. So the Shema is made up of three sounds, right? There's a sh sound, yeah? There's a M sound, and there's an ah sound. Nachon, it's a shin, mem, ayin, sh, m, ah. So, I heard this from a rabbi many years ago, but I, I saw it written elsewhere, and he says this is a meditative quality. It's a shh. You're quieting down your mind. Then you contemplate. Mm. Then. Ah, I get it. So it's shh, mm, ah. Isn't that cute? Mm -hmm. It's good, Did you right? Say this at what? Did you say this at Mina's house? Ah, cool. I don't remember. I don't remember. I've said it before. I heard it a bunch of years ago, but I forgot about it and just came back to work for Shem. It's a, there's a meditative quality of shh, mm, ah. Right? They go with it. Isn't that great? I thought you'd like that. Um, Okay, so when a boy comes bar mitzvah, um, and a boy becomes chayav in mitzvot, the first mitzvah that is usually done for the bar mitzvah is to read the Shema at night time. Because remember, we can see when we get there, v'shachcha uvkomecha, there's mitzvah to read the Shema in the morning and at night time. Interestingly, the first tractate of the Talmud is Barachot, it speaks about blessings and prayers, right? Shows how integral this course is, what we're learning is, but it all speaks about the Shema. Okay, when do we, when does the obligation to say Shema really begin? So there's a whole discussion backwards and forwards, but in the end it's nighttime, meaning once the stars have come out. And so if a person says the Shema earlier, for example, like an early Arvit, an early Mariv, they would have to repeat the Shema at nighttime once the stars have come out. Okay, that's how to fulfill that Torah mitzvah of the Shema. And so when a boy comes to a mitzvah, Right? It kicks in at night time, and the first mitzvah he has is Seir Shema. Usually we have the boy lead the Arvit prayer in the Bet Knesset, for that reason. It says, uh, page 63, Mitzvah Roshon, Chayav Adam, 
When a boy becomes 13, who? Krisha Mashal Arvit. He now gets to do the first myth. The first myth he does is the Krisha Mashal Arvit. Okay? Right? He, could, he could do something right before. He could do Kibbut of Aim or something. I mean, you know, those things. But that's the first official mitzvah we give the boy. Okay? The next morning he'll put on tefillin. Although he'd been putting on tefillin before for probably a month. But actually the obligation kicks in, right? Because it gets dark, he does mitzvah. Okay? So from here, you learn a very important concept. And what's that? Which we want to give this young boy who's about to become bar mitzvah. And that is that life gets dark because our days begin at night time, as we see from creation. Vayer vayivoker yom echad. So our days begin at night time, not, not at midnight, right? But when the sun goes down, we're in that territory. When stars come out, it's, it's Vadai Laila. And so he has to learn that even though in the dark times of life, you have to say Shema and praise Hashem. That's the first principle <clears throat> we give this uh, young boy. Right? We say to him, even through this difficulty and darkness, okay? We can't see Hashem, even so. And then eventually it will come to fill it with wealth of clear understanding, which is like the light of day. So all of our days go from darkness to light. All of our days go from darkness to light. So we take the Shema at night time, time of darkness, and that's where the Arvit, Erev. The word Erev, right, when the first mitzvah comes in, actually means, well, it means night, but it also means. Also means murav. What's murav? Mixed together. Mixed together, yeah. Mixed up. Right? Because at night time you can't see anything. Everything's mixed up. But it's also a metaphor for uh, the difficult times of life. Things are mixed up. I don't have clarity. I don't have clarity. So the mitzvah of Shema begins at night time. That's when it begins. And for the mitzvah boy, we see that clearly because that's when he becomes by mitzvah. At night time, it's dark, it's difficult times, difficult times in Jewish history, difficult times in life. And now I'm going to praise Hashem at those times. And through this, I'll get to the morning Shema, which is going to give me the clarity of day and the clarity, clarity of understanding what my mission is in life. Okay? So the Shema, already we're seeing, it's becoming a philosophical work. It's becoming a spiritual work. It's got a med meditative experience in, in, enveloped inside it as well. It's all there. Okay, declaration of faith, witness to God. Everything is there, which will explain why it's a Torah mitzvah. Okay? First mitzvah, last mitzvah, first mitzvah by mitzvah boy, first words on a child's lips, last word on a uh, 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 soon to be dis um, deceased person's lips as well. It pretty much permeates everything that we do, everything that we say, and everything that we are as a people. And somehow, deep inside here is everything. The Vilna Gaon, I don't think I brought it in here, even says and matches it up word or expression for word, the first paragraph of the Shema and the Aset Adibrot. I once saw the parallel. The only one I remember is the Ahavta is with Shabbat. Right? We love, the we have Ahava, we're going to say, right? He's connected to Shabbat because we love Shabbat. Right? And Shabbat is all about love of Hashem, which is why we actually add the word Ahava in our... Um, Shabbat prayers many times, okay? Which we don't actually add into the Chagim prayers. We'll see in many Siddurim. So he actually finds the Ten Commandments, right, which is the root of all the other mitzvot in the first paragraph of the Shema and parallels. You know, I'm going to find that parallel. I want to try to find it for you and I'll, I'll show it to you inside. It's actually fascinating how every principle of the Shema linked somehow thematically to the Ten Commandments, okay? Okay. Um, okay, let's do the first paragraph as much as we can. Let's just go through the words themselves and try to understand them because we're going to see in these words a number of very important principles. We're going to see acceptance of God as a single source. That's the Shem Echad. Right? We are going to see um, the mitzvah to love Hashem, which is the first mitzvah, really, to study and teach Torah, which is Hashem's communication to us, where to fill in and mezuzah. Okay, so let's go through together. So, Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Listen, hear, understand, Israel. The Lord is our God, the Lord is one. 
And then we whisper, Baruch Hashem Kevul Machatoli Alam Ba'ed. Okay, we'll discuss that um, next class as to why that is whispered and yet said loudly on Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur. Okay. Who's in my Yom Kippur class over there? Anybody? I think we talked about this already. In this class? I did already? I did the whole thing on that already? I, I'm I spoke I about it here. I don't remember. I spoke about it this semester. I don't remember who I spoke it to. Why we say Shema, why we say the Shema loudly and Baruch Shem quietly? Do we do it in this class? No. Good. Okay, we'll do it. Mr. Shem. Okay, fine, but not for now. Okay. And then we start. Vahavta. You should love. Et Hashem Alakach, the Lord your God. Vahol of Avacha. With all your heart. Vahol Nafshacha. With all your soul. Vahol Moidecha. And all of your. Might. So the word Moidecha is a difficult word to translate. Can anyone see a word inside there? Um, no, that's the Vav. Yeah? Yeah, what's Maod? Lot. Right. With a lot. Yes, all your resources. Right. You should love Hashem, the Lord your God, with all your heart, all your soul, and all your resources. What's interesting about the word Levavcha, if you were to do this grammatically correctly, what would you write down, by the way? You should be writing all these notes down. Levavcha, what should it say? Libecha. Libecha. Right? Libecha. Should be one vet. It says Levavcha. That's not grammatically correct, I don't believe. Right? Libcha. Your heart. How does Rashi answer that? Anybody remember? Levavcha, your hearts. So Rashi answers this and says, she gets from the Gemara, Levavcha is from both your inclinations, both your hearts. The Yetzir Tov and the Yetzir Ra. We have the Yetzir Tov, English to do good. We have the Yetzir Ra, English to do bad. Says Rashi, you know what? It comes to this. When you love Hashem, you love Hashem with your good inclinations. And some of you have bad inclinations, you should channel those bad inclinations that we all have. And even channel, channel those towards the Gorosh Baruch Hu and God. Okay? So that's the Ahavta, which is the same gematria we said Ahava is 13, which by the way, the side point, 13, is a good number for the Jewish people. Right? Just pick that up. One thing over here. Hashem Alekecha with your heart, your soul, all your money. Right? It costs money. Right? To be a spiritual person, you've got to pay for Shabbat, you've got to pay for Chagim. Right? You've got to pay for education. Right? It costs money. Don't think that it's some kind of you know, free thing. Right? Give it tzedakah. Okay? That costs money. Right? 10% actually as a minimum of your income. So all that is included as well. Okay? And it's a tefill, it's a prayer that we should have the resources in order to pay for those things as well. It says, These words I'm telling you right now, I share Anochi Mitzavrayom. Anochi is an unusual word. We see it somewhere else. Where do you see the word Anochi? Shana Shriki. That's correct. What does that mean? Oh, you are? All oh, right. Right. So the word Ani is I. Anochi is actually four letters that represent four words. Ana. You have to, I'll tell it to you in the Hebrew. It's actually Aramaic. But you can write it down. Just get the translation down, though. Ana. I. Nafshi. My soul, Ketavti, has written, Yahavti, and given. I, my soul, has been written and given. This is Hashem speaking. I have no idea what that means. I'm just telling you what it means. Ana, Aleph, Nun, Chaf, Yud. Ana, Nafshi, I, my soul, it's Hashem speaking. I don't understand Hashem, never mind his soul. I can't, I can't know God, let alone his soul, but this is what it says. Ketavti is written, Yahavti, and given. That is the Torah. That is a reference to the Torah. If you want to know God, you study Hashem's Torah, of which the Shema is part of. Which the Shema is part of. Yeah? So once you say that word, you are testifying that the Karish Baruch Hu is the one who gave us the entire Torah. Right? And if you want to know God, you learn Torah, which you're doing at the same time, by the way. Mitzavcha Hayom Alavavecha, which I've commanded you, all these words I commanded you, put them upon your hearts. I mean, if you read the translation in the art scroll or whatever, you'll see it says heart. Right? Put it on your heart, that means you should internalize it and make it part of your emotional being. Heart is always a metaphor for the emotional being, which is why when you get excited, or you fall in love, your heart beats much faster. Ah. <laughs> right? And immediately, this, but there's so much here that we could spend the entire course discussing this one paragraph. It's all here. Everything you need to know about everything is in this one paragraph. Okay? And we're just touching the surface. 
meet physics, you have to love Hashem your God. Right? First degree. Say to a kid, love Hashem your God. Do it with your heart, your soul, your desires, and your might. The shinantam levanecha. Pass it to the next generation. Teach it to the kids. Don't be selfish. It's not just for you, right? You're part of the Jewish people. There's a generational aspect to this as well. Okay? So number one is children, which is why the first thing we do with our kids is teach them the Shema, right? The first verse of the Shema. Teach it to your children. Vidibar tabam. And talk about it. Talk about spirituality. Talk about the topics we're going to talk about in the Shema. Let it become a discussion. Beshift chavavetecha. Or sit in your home. Let your home be filled with Torah and talk of mitzvot. Uvelecht chavaderech. And when you're out of your home, right, you're out of your home, where do we see evidence of this? Where do we see a beautiful evidence of this in your home? Out of your home? Mezuzah, right. The mezuzah goes on your doorpost of your home. What does the doorpost of your home represent? So the doorpost of your home represents the interface between inside the home and outside the home. And the Shema is written inside there. So we're going to do something crazy. Crazy. We're going to cut and paste, literally cut, right, on a cloth, not cut it, but write on a piece of cloth, piece of parchment, these words, and put them onto our, roll it up, and put it onto our doorposts. So we're thinking about it when we go into our home, and think about it before we leave our home. Which is why the custom is to put a hand on the, right, say a prayer, or to kiss the mezuzah, right? But the, why, the, why is this, these words put on the doorpost? Because you're about to go into the outside world, don't forget everything you have in your home, and you're out, about to go inside. Yeah, don't forget the lessons you learn out there and all the toys you learn out there, which you're going to try to bring into your home as well. So the Shema represents the interface, the connection of outside to inside. Don't be an outsider, be an insider, which you have inside, take with you outside. And remember, you have when you go outside. Okay. When you go to sleep and when you wake up. And from here, we're going to learn the mitzvah to say the Shema in the morning and at night time. There's a whole discussion. What does morning mean? What does night time mean? Right? Does it mean when you wake up or when you go to sleep? Well, no, because, you know, you're in college. Your wake up could be, right, past one o'clock. It could be too late for the mitzvah of Shema. Right? So, um, past, well, actually 9.30 in most cases, okay? So it means when people wake up. Right? When the rest of the world, the non-college people actually wake up. Okay? That's what we're talking about. Over Shachpa when you go to sleep, of Kumecha when you wake up. So Shachpa is when people go to sleep. I know you're working so hard, I don't get to sleep till like 8 in the morning. Right? It's not going to work. It means at a time of waking up, at a time of sleeping. That's what it means, which is morning and night, the first three hours a day. And this mitzvah of Shema actually can be said the entire night time, ideally before midnight or halach at midnight. But if not, you have the entire night to say the Shema. Okay? Until. Uh, uh, daybreak. Ukshartam, and these words you have to bind, tie, laot as a sign, al yadecha, on your arm, vayulototafot benenecha, and as a sign between your eyes. Okay, this is a reference to the mitzvah of tefillin. Uchatav, that's why the Shema is written with tefillin. Uchatavtam al mutavetecha visharecha, and put them as mezuzot. Okay, betecha or visharecha. Okay, the word mezuzot can be scrambled, says the Zohar, I believe. I think it's the Zohar. Zaz mavet. Removes death. Removes death. That's the power of the mezuzah, which the mezuzah is basically the, the Shema inside it. It has that power uh, as well. Okay? On your houses and your gates. Okay. That is paragraph number one. Let's go through this acceptance of Hashem, the Shema. Hashem is Echad, He is one. Mitzvah to love Hashem, study and teach Torah, pass on to your children, to fill in, more about that later on, and Mezuzot. Right? Probably enough of the mitzvah. And inside there we said, somehow attached to all this are the Sarah Dibrot. Okay, that's number one. We'll stop over there so we can prepare for our midterms.